वैष्णवं श्रीरूप सागर जाता सह गना रघुनाथान्वता सजीव साधवैत सवधुत परजना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्री राधा कृष्ण पदा सह गना ललिता श्री विशाखान्वता हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी श्री राधे वृंदवनेश्वरी विष्णु भानु सुतदेव प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचकल्पतरुभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna. So I think yesterday we did 7.24, the verse where Krishna condemns Mayavad philosophy, and today we are going to start with 7.25, which is kind of in continu continuation of what Krishna had said in 7.24. I was about I was about to say what what Krishna had said yesterday, <laughs> but actually we read it yesterday. So all right, are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Let's recite this verse. So you can repeat after me. Na ham prakash sarvasya. Na ham prakash sarvasya. Yoga maya samavrita. Yoga maya samavrita. Mudho yam na bhi janati. Mudho yam na bhi janati. Loko mama jam abhyam. Loko mama jam abhyam. Na ham prakash sarvasya. नाहम प्रकाश सर्वस्य योग माया समावृतः योग माया समावृतः मूढो यम ना भी जानाति मूढो यम ना भी जानाति लोको मामजम अव्ययम लोको मामजम अव्ययम नाहम प्रकाश सर्वस्य नाहम प्रकाश सर्वस्य योग माया समावृतः योग माया समावृतः मूढ़ो यम ना भी जानाति मूढ़ो यम ना भी जानाति लोको मामजम अव्ययम लोको मामजम अव्ययम निमस निमनेस वुड लाइक टू रिसाइट ना हम प्रकाश सर्वस्य ना हम प्रकाश सर्वस्य योग माया समावृतः योग माया समावृतः मूढ़ो यम ना भी जानाति मूढ़ो यम ना भी जानाति लोको मामजम अव्ययम लोको मामजम अव्ययम एनीवन एल्स ना हम प्रकाश सर्वस्य ना हम प्रकाश सर्वस्य योग माया समाप्रतः योग माया समाप्रतः मूढ़ो यम ना भी जानाति मूढ़ो यम ना भी जानाति लोको मामजम अव्ययम लोको मामजम अव्ययम एनीवन एस ओके लेट्स रिसाइड द सिनोनिम्स ना ना नॉर नॉर अहम अहम आय आय प्रकाश प्रकाश मैनिफेस्ट Manifest. Sarvasya. Sarvasya. To everyone. To everyone. Yoga Maya. Yoga Maya. By internal potency. By internal potency. Samavrita. Samavrita. Covered. Covered. Mudha. Mudha. Foolish. Foolish. I am. I am. These. These. Na. Na. Not. Not. अभी जानाती अभी जानाती कैन अंडरस्टैंड कैन अंडरस्टैंड लोक लोक पर्सन्स पर्सन्स माम माम मी मी अजम अजम अनबोर्न अनबोर्न अव्ययम 
avyayam inexhaustible inexhaustible translation and purport by his divine grace sri bhakti vedan swami shila prabhupad i am never i am never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent for them i am covered by my internal potency and therefore they do not know that i am unborn and infallible purport it may be argued that since krishna was visible to everyone when he was present on this earth how can it be said that he is not manifest to everyone but actually he was not manifest to everyone when krishna was present there were only a few people who could understand him to be the supreme personality of godhead in the assembly of kurus when shishupal spoke against krishna's being elected president of the assembly bhishma supported him and proclaimed him to be the supreme god similarly the pandavas and a few others knew that he was the supreme but not everyone he was not revealed to the non devotees and the common man therefore in the bhagavad gita krishna says that but for his pure devotees all men consider him to be like themselves he was manifest only to his devotees as the reservoir of all pleasure but to others to unintelligent non devotees he was covered by his internal potency in the prayers of kunti in the shrimad bhagavatam 1.8.19 it is said that the lord is covered by the curtain of yoga maya and thus ordinary people cannot understand him this yoga maya curtain is also confirmed in the ishopanishad mantra 15 in which the devotee prays hiranmayena patrena satyasya pite pihit pihitam mukham tattvam pushan aprinu satya dharmaya drishtaye O oh my lord you are the maintainer of the entire universe and devotional service to you is the highest religious principle therefore i pray that you will also maintain me your transcendental form is covered by the yoga maya the brahma jyoti is the covering of the internal potency may you kindly remove this glowing effulgence that impedes my seeing your sachidananda vigraha your eternal form of bliss and knowledge The supreme personality of Godhead in his transcendental form of bliss and knowledge is covered by the internal potency of the Brahma Jyoti, and the less intelligent impersonalist cannot see the supreme on this account. Also in the Shrimad Bhagavatam ten dot fourteen dot seven, there is this prayer by Brahma: "O supreme personality of Godhead, O super soul, O master of all mystery, who can calculate your potency?" and past times in this world you are always expanding your internal potency and therefore no one can understand you learned scientists and learned scholars can examine the atomic constitution of the material world or even the planets but still they are unable to calculate your energy and potency although you are present before them the supreme personality of godhead lord krishna is not only unborn but also avyaya inexhaustible his eternal form is bliss and knowledge and his energies are all inexhaustible namo vishnu padaya krishna prishthaya bhutale shrimate bhakti vedanta swami niti namine namaste saraswati devi gauravani pracharine nirvishesh shunyavadi paschatya desh karine read the translation one more time i am never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent for them i am covered by my internal potency and therefore they do not know that i am unborn and infallible Hare Krishna. So Krishna is talking about foolish people and how Krishna is not manifest to foolish people. He is covered by his internal potency. Any idea who are these foolish people that Krishna is talking about here? Well, everyone, all the kurus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, but in the context of what Krishna had said, uh, in seven point twenty four. uh where uh, what was the verse uh, avyaktam vyaktim apannam manyante mama buddhaya param bhavam ajananto mam avyam anuttamam so there krishna had said that they are unintelligent they do not have any any intelligence so they are actually uh, in that sense foolish so in that context krishna is talking about we can understand that you know most likely he is talking about the mayavadis but also in the same chapter krishna had talked about four kinds of people who do not surrender to krishna who do not understand who krishna who krishna really is and what is his position so <coughs> excuse me so there are the people the four kinds of people who do not surrender there are some people who surrender to krishna so these are two extremes and in between there are others so there are the people who surrender to something else other than krishna uh there are people who completely misunderstand krishna's position krishna krishna's form you know and they tend to say that you know we all are same you know we all are equal we are we all are god 
you know so there are you know so to different degrees people do not understand krishna uh, you know the, so the the degree of their covering is different you know so in 7.13 if you remember krishna had said the same thing in a different way krishna had said tribhir gunamair bhaver ebihi sarvam jagat so ebihi sarvam idam jagat mohitam na abhijanati mam ebih param abhyayam so he had said deluded by the three modes the whole world does not know me you know so actually and here krishna is saying the same thing in a different way he is saying that uh, actually so the people are covered by the three modes but here krishna is saying that krishna is covered by yoga maya naham prakash sarvasya yoga maya samavritah so in general the understanding is that uh, there is mahamaya and there is yoga maya so krishna cannot be covered by mahamaya you know so mahamaya is covering the uh, the the general people in one sense and krishna is covered not that he uh, is deluded and he is covered in that sense but krishna by his own will you know he manifests his internal potency and he covers himself you know and that's where prabhupada is quoting that verse from uh, shri shopnishad hiranyamayana patrena that you know oh my lord you are the maintainer of the entire universe and devotional service to you is the highest religious principle therefore I, therefore i pray that you will also maintain me what transcendental form is covered by the yoga maya so this is very important the brahma jyoti is the covering of the internal potency may you kindly remove this glowing effulgence that impedes my seeing your sachidanand vigraha your eternal form of bliss and knowledge so the point is that krishna is not deluded by yoga maya he is by he by his own will he is covering himself you know and uh, uh, he uh, he can reveal himself you know if he wants to reveal himself so and that will become more clearer in the next verse when we go to that you know, these there are three verses which are in sequence and we can talk about it um but um, <clears throat> there is a similar verse uh, that comes in the fourth chapter where krishna says that actually ajopi san avyatma bhutanam ishwaropi san prakritim swamadishthaya sambhavami atmamayaya so there krishna says similarly you know here he has said that he is ajam uh, in this verse he is saying that in 7.25 uh, he is using the last loko mam ajam avyayam they do not understand that i am unborn and i am inexhaustible so there also in 4.6 he is saying the same thing that although i am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates and although i am the lord of all living entity i still appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form so uh here the the word that krishna uses atma maya so atma maya is actually what krishna is referring to internal potency it is actually yoga maya atma maya yoga maya they are used interchangeably here in uh, you know uh the the mahamaya is also krishna's potency but it is external potency now in essence you know, for krishna both are same mahamaya and yoga maya for krishna from a, from krishna's perspective how it is is we understand that this world you know it is a reflection of uh, the spiritual world you know this world is is real in a sense that it is a real reflection but you know whatever can be done in a reflection that only you know so it is like a um perverted uh, you know um perverted reflection of the spiritual world so in the spiritual world yoga maya exists and the perverted reflection of yoga maya in this world is mahamaya so in that sense from krishna's perspective both yoga maya and mahamaya are same the same yoga maya that exists in the spiritual world that becomes mahamaya when it comes to the material world so uh, this is talked about by krishna in the 15th verse uh, in the 15th chapter first verse urdha mula madha shakam ashvattam prahoravyam chandamsi asya parnani astam vedasa vedavati that this world is you know there is an upside down banyan tree you know and nobody can see where it starts nobody can know where it ends so that is actually upside down banyan tree acharya has explained it is actually a reflection the original tree exists in the spiritual world and because it is a perverted reflection in the material world it appears upside down so from that context both yoga maya and mahamaya are same but when when the yoga maya is in the spiritual world it is known, known as yoga maya but when the same yoga maya is is reflecting in the material world it is known as mahamaya so 
the uh, the uh, mahamaya works opposite to yogamaya yogamaya is is meant to take uh, people or devotees towards krishna and mahamaya is uh, taking people away from krishna so when a person is attracted for a when a man is attracted to a woman or when a person is attracted to wealth you know and then they just go all out in you know for fulfilling their whatever desires they have so that is because of mahamaya but when when someone is attracted towards krishna and when he goes all out towards you know achieving krishna that is actually a function of yogamaya so yogamaya makes sure that this persons you know he gets attracted to krishna and then he moves in that direction so um, ajam and avyayam there are two adjectives that krishna is using here so i am unborn unborn so how does it that and how is it that krishna is present here so we understand that he is not born in a sense that the way normal people are born he appears so his appearance and disappearance is compared to the appearance of the sun you know so sun is always there but in the morning when it comes out you know we say oh so the sun is there now so similarly krishna is always there but and according to his own sweet will he appears uh, in the material world and that that's why he is called as unborn but he you know sambhavami atma maya also in that verse also he says that i appear so and of i am inexhaustible now his personality is inexhaustible it's not that his personal his personality will go and merge into brahman and then he will lose his personal existence that's not going to happen so he 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 will talk about that in the 8th chapter that he has his own spiritual world so that will come later so we'll give a glimpse of the, the spiritual world in the 8th chapter you know a little bit uh, he had been talking about it that in this way you can come to me 4.9th verse if you remember very clearly krishna says that you know uh, people who understand me tatvatah who understand me in truth you know who understand the truth about my appearance the nature of my activities and my appearance and disappearance you know in truth they can come back to me so there you know there is a hint you know he can come back to me in a sense you know there has to be a place where he lives and people can go and live at that place called with krishna but he with explicitly he has not introduced the spiritual world which he will do in the 8th chapter and again he will talk about it in the 15th chapter he'll give more details about it you know that that place is not illumined by the sun the moon the electricity etc so that introduction to the spiritual world will come in the 8th chapter and then he will uh, gives further details about it in the 15th chapter so are there any questions or comments or any realizations anything that anyone would like to mention here for this particular verse before we move on to the next prabhu can you explain uh, how uh, krishna's abhyayam uh, i know inexhaustible means what it means but can you be more elaborate on okay so my uh, understanding mataji is that when he says i am inexhaustible i am abhyayam abhyayam means fallible so uh, you know this uh, let me open the verses this is talked about in the 15th chapter let me there are three verses where krishna speaks in the 15th chapter towards the end which talks about yeah okay Are you able to see my screen? Yes, Prabhu. Okay, so here these are these three verses, sixteen, seventeen. Actually, from this section onwards, we'll see how Krishna is in inexhaustible. So, dwa o ima o purusha o loke kshares cha kshare eva cha kshara sarvani bhutani kutastha kshareuchyate. So here Krishna says there are two classes of beings: the fallible and the infallible. In the material world, every living entity is fallible, and in the spiritual world, every living entity is called infallible. so the idea here is that the the material bodies they fall you know the material bodies have no lasting existence you know all of us you know because we have material bodies we are repeatedly taking uh, you know acquiring different bodies and in that sense our bodies are temporary but in the spiritual world there is no matter you know it's it's permanent and therefore the people at the uh, the living beings who are in the spiritual world they are called infallible because their 
bodies do not fall and they do not have material bodies where it you know the body takes birth you know it grows it deteriorates and finally it uh, you know it succumbs and that is not the idea in the spiritual world now further krishna says in the next verse uttamaha purushas tu anyah paramatmete udarita yo lokatrayam avishya bibarte avya ishvara besides these two there is the greatest living personality the supreme soul the imperishable lord himself who has entered the three worlds and is maintaining them so here krishna is making uh, very clear that you know krishna is beyond the fallible and the infallible and he is imperishable you know he never it never happens that you know he perishes or his form uh, in any sense changes or deteriorates he always exists in the same form you know so uh, in that sense his form is always present over there in the spiritual world you know and he is beyond both the fallible and the infallible he actually maintains Uh, the both the fallible and the infallible you no know, he is actually the sustainer in one sense and then he says yasmat kshara mati to ham akshara api chottama to asmi loke vidicha pratitah purushottam so he says because i am transcendental beyond both the fallible and infallible and because i am the greatest i am celebrated both in the world and in the vedas as that supreme person so the idea here is that you know uh, because he is fa- he is beyond fallible and infallible and you know he is the greatest there is no one uh, equal to him or no nobody even greater than him and therefore he is celebrated in the world and in the vedas as the supreme person so and then he says that actually one who and you know who knows this uh, this truth about me yo maam eva masam mudo janati purushottam sa sarvavid bhajate maam sarvabhave na bharat ab who knows me as the supreme personality over without doubting is a knower of everything he therefore engages himself in full devotional service to me o son of bharat so he is giving for the details that okay after knowing this what are we supposed to do so there is a similar verse that comes in the uh, 10th chapter sa vikalpe na yoga na something like that i'm missing the verse 10.6 i believe that you know once a person understands the opulence of krishna he doesn't have any other uh, alternative so vikalpe na vikalp means alternative but to render service to krishna because once you understand krishna's position and how and our position in comparison to krishna you know how krishna is the greatest and we are not not even like a dust particle in front of him so and then at the same time he is is also not just greatest he is also the sweetest then you know we wholeheartedly worship krishna So there is no other alternative left. And then he says, "Iti guhiya tamam shastra mida muktam maya na ghaye tad budhva budhi man syat krita kritya shya Bharata." This is the most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures. Oh, sinless one, it is disclosed now by me. Whoever understands this will become wise, and his endeavors with no perfection. So this is the most confidential. Iti guhiya tamam shastram. And the same thing Krishna talks about in the ninth chapter. Idam tu te guhiya tamam. I'll now disclose to you the most confidential knowledge. So the the title of the chapter of the ninth chapter is also the most confidential knowledge so that is my understanding of uh, imperishable or inexhaustible that his personality is you know he as a person always exist he he existed before everyone anyone else existed he continues to exist while we exist and he will exist even after our existence is over so that is inexhaustible but Thank if you, you have any different understanding mathi please share No, Prabhu. I am not so uh, no knowledge. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, my inexhaustible is like there's no end to his energy. Like we are, we become exhausted. Our energy becomes exhausted, <laughs> finished. But Very no, easily. <laughs> yeah, there's no end to Krishna's energy. It continues. So you know, like in like just even like with respect to matter, right? Like they'll use forms like um like they'll use it in the context of like let's say, um, renewable energy and exhaustible energy. You know, like coal and all that I refer to energy that gets depleted. Gold is exhaustible energy, but wind and solar is renewable and it's not exhaustible. Good point. endless yep mm-hmm. and uh, i think one of the verse at proper quotes it also says that he is expanding his spiritual potency all the time so forget about mm-hmm. uh, perishing it is you know increasing it's it. ever expanding <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> increasing more and more increasing yeah yeah so there's a verse also navanavarasa something like that i'm missing that mm-hmm. verse but the idea is that in the spiritual world there is 
there is you know we say okay no whatever we you know you, whatever pleasure is there in the rituals but after some time we'll get bored out of it but then nature explain that it is never never rasa so because the spiritual potency is ever expanding we find newer and newer pleasures you know in that spiritual the taste is never uh, you know it's not that we'll get bored of the spiritual pleasure i have a question so if this material world is a complete reflection of the spiritual world and not real how is it only if when it's when we utilize it in krishna service that it becomes spiritualized or you know how can like the unreal be even operational like a reflection be operational yeah so okay so it's a good question so no um it is unreal in a sense it's not unreal you know we understand that it is real but it is a reflection um so uh, in the shri shopnishad the invocation verse i'm missing that uh, uh, how it starts om purna madah purna vidam purnat pur so the the idea is that you know krishna is complete and all the uh, manifestations that are coming out of krishna they are also complete you know and they are fully capable of maintaining the existence in whatever form the existence exist on that particular you know in that particular manifestation so from a material perspective you know whatever is required for our existence you know, that is available here you know it is because it is krishna's potency it will maintain our material existence you know in the in whatever form it is it is available but the idea is that uh when we say it is a reflection the uh, we because we are souls we are part and parcels of krishna we are also satchidananda you know we are also sat in a sense that we are eternal the soul is eternal chit means we are full of knowledge now the chit uh, uh, doesn't mean that we are we have full knowledge but it says that we have we are full of knowledge we have a lot of knowledge and anand we are constantly pleasure seeking so that idea that we are constantly pleasure seeking you know that actually puts us in misery because there is no real pleasure available because it's a it's a reflection and we are trying to seek pleasure in the reflection we are not able to find that pleasure and that's where we are always hankering more for more and more and more and more and what we are doing in a sense is we are expanding our material existence in a hope that we'll find pleasure by expanding our material existence you know um, material existence in the sense we want to acquire more and more things we want to have relationships with more and more people and we think that by this we'll get get uh, pleasure but because there is no real pleasure available here now therefore we are always hankering so in that sense the real pleasure will never come to us and because we are pleasure seeking all everything that we do in our life we always the idea is that we want to get some joy out of it you know there's nothing that we don't say that oh today i'm bored of having joy or you know having fun you know and now let me do something to get some misery so that i get a different taste we never say that so we can understand that you know we are constantly pleasure seeking but there is no real pleasure available we are seeking the pleasure at the wrong place you know because it's a reflection will not get the real pleasure that real real pleasure is available in the spiritual world in that sense we have to go to the real place to get the real pleasure so the reflection is a unit that's fully sustainable but temporarily you're saying right. that yep temporary in the sense we uh, you know there is a so even the material world is sustained and it uh, there is a, you know it is destroyed where it is created again so that manifestation that cycle and, keeps going yeah, yeah going on and the souls keep coming back to the you know, who are trapped in the material world who just want to enjoy material uh, pleasure they just keep coming back to the material world you know but uh, they don't get any real pleasure over here i know what a hapless existence huh? <laughs> yeah <laughs> well except in serving the the lord you know so that option is there to go back home yeah that's where krishna the whole point of bhagavad gita is to how to bring the souls back to the spiritual world so because krishna makes it clear at the end that if you surrender to me you, know, you will come back to me for sure i guarantee this so he he's the only one who can extricate you from here yep <laughs> rescue us <laughs> rescue us yes. so bhagavad gita is this is rescue mission actually <laughs> rescue mission yeah bring the lost souls back to the 911 <laughs> <laughs> so kwaiku prabhu has a comment it seems go ahead prabhu ji 
your hand is uh, Krishna Prabhuji. So what were you saying earlier on that I just wanted to understand Sat Chit Ananda means that which seek that which is seeking the pleasure. No, so Sat Chit and Ananda are three different things. Sat means eternal, Chit means knowledge, you know, and uh, Chit can have multiple meanings, but in this context, it means knowledge. And Anand means uh, uh, Anand is not just simple joy. You know, Anand means blissful. And the soul is always blissful. It is eternal. It is full of knowledge. It is always blissful. And because it is blissful, the nature is like that. You know, it is that is the innate nature of soul being blissful. And therefore, it is seeking that bliss even in the material world. You know, but the pro the problem is that we are not finding that real bliss here in this material world. You know, everything that we do. You know, it is for some kind, even for the simple act of eating, you know, we understand that it is meant to sustain our existence, but we want to relish eating also. We prepare different cuisines and we want to taste different things and we want to make sure that even the, the process of eating is more and more pleasurable. So everything that we are doing here is to get some pleasure out of it. Even our, you know, if we have to commute to a, from one place to another, you know, our, at least we think that, you know, I should have a good car, you know, although we may spend only 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but all of us are seeking a good car and a more comfortable and, you know, I should have this feature, that feature in the car. So the idea is that we want more and more comfort. We want more and more luxury. We are seeking pleasure in different ways. See, my confusion with the, sta the statement is, it says, sat chit, I got that, eternal knowledge, um, blissful, but then you're translating the blissful to mean that ple uh, worldly pleasure. Not worldly pleasure. Blissful means we are, we are naturally blissful. That is our nature. You know, we are always, the soul is always blissful. Mm -hmm. And because the soul is blissful, it seeks more and more pleasure. You know, it wants to enjoy. You know, that is, you know, if you are blissful, you know, if say for example, uh, some, you know, on a one on a given day, you are very happy. You, know, you just, I'm just giving a an example. You know, really happy. You know, you are just, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you may have seen kids. You know, mm -hmm. they are so happy sometimes that you know they are just they can't control their laughter. They are just laughing for no reason. I've seen it with my kids. And if you are so blissful and suddenly you go to a room where everyone is, you know, uh, you know, glum and gloomy, you know, and then you will think, what's going on here? Why guys, you are not, you know, why are you so sad? You know, why are you so gloomy? So what happens is, you know, you want to have, you know, something to enjoy over there because you are in a, you know, very good mood, but in a mood, but everybody else is in a gloomy or, you know, a dull mood. So what will happen is, you know, either you will try to make them happy, you know, okay, cheer up, you know, just have some fun, let's have party, or you will leave that place because you're saying, oh, these guys are so crazy. I don't know why they are sad. So because you are seeking pleasure in, in at that particular time, so that is actually the nature of the soul. That the soul is naturally happy. It is naturally blissful, and because it is blissful, it wants to, you know, have more and more bliss. So, but we are seeking that. So, because we are in the material world, the soul is trying to seek that bliss, that happiness in the material world. But this, this material world, you know, we are not getting that real happiness because this place is, it is the analogy that is given by the Acharya is like the fish out of water. You know, if you take the fish out of water and you give it all the comforts, give it nice food to eat, give it a car, you know, give it a nice, uh, you know, house, big house with eight, a bed eight bedrooms with good servants. But the fish will not be happy outside water. It will just wiggle for some time and then it will die. So similarly, that is our condition. We are outside, we are in a, you know, in a abnormal condition you know, that this is not our natural condition because we are, uh, uh, we are spiritual beings and we are in the material world. So this material world is like, you know, we are out of the spiritual world and this is artificial uh, environment for us. So, and then what happens is we just wiggle for some time in a sense that we hanker for things and we lament for things that we have lost. So, and then after some time we die. <laughs> so that is our real condition here in this material world. Right, right. Okay, well, you know, I'll let you move on and we'll finish on. I think this is a very broad subject. Me and you will pick it up another time. And you mean knowledge? 
No, but you know, the, the reason why the word struck out to me and I started asking about it was earlier on today, I was listening to something, um, you know, you know, about, you know, knowledge and self-knowledge and, you know, um, the Gyani yoga, is that how it's said? Yeah, so something to that. And the word was mentioned. So when you said it, I was just trying to, you know, understand the relationship between that. But I recognize if we're going into that, we'll divert totally from, <laughs> from what we are discussing right now. That's why I said, you know, we'll pick it up another time. And sure. Because we are not discussing that uh, path of yoga right now. So. Yeah, the Gyan Yoga will come later. The 13th right. chapter onwards. This right. full Gyan right. Yoga is there. Right. right. So it was something about self-knowledge. And they mentioned it, I think, as one of the mantras people use or something like that. And when you mentioned it, I was just kind of curious to understand a little more. Aham Brahmasmi. Is that the mantra you're talking about? Well, that was mentioned, but that... Tat uh, Chit Ananda was also okay. mentioned. And it just struck me. I, I thought, you know, trying to see the relationship between what I had listening to earlier on with Ahambra Masmi and all that and how it tied into this in particular. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, we can discuss it later. Okay, yes. Talk to you later. You. All right. Any other comments, questions? Anyone would like to add anything to what I said? in response to any of these questions. Okay, if not, we can move on to the next verse. Where did my browser go? Okay, it's here. Okay, now Krishna describes the real thing. So let's recite this verse just once and then we read the translation and the purport. Can repeat after me. Veda ham samtitani. Veda ham samtitani. Vartmanani charjuna. Vartmanani charjuna. Bhavishyani chabhutani. Bhavishyani chabhutani. Mam tu vedana kaschana. Mam tu vedana kaschana. Veda ham samtitani. Veda Santitani Vartamanani Charjuna Vartamanani Charjuna Bhavishyani Chabhutani Bhavishyani Chabhutani Mam to Vedana Kashchina Mam to Vedana Kashchina Veda Ham Samtitani Veda Ham Samtitani Vartamanani Charjuna Vartmanani Chajjuna Bhavishyani Chabhutani Bhavishyani Chabhutani Mam to Vedana Kashchina Mam to Vedana Kashchina Anyone else like to recite this verse? I'll try okay. first. Oh, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Kwaku. Go. Okay, thank you. Vedaham Samatitani Vedaham Samatitani Vartamanani Charjuna Vartamanani Charjuna Bavishyani Chabutani Bavishyani Chabutani Mam to Vedana Kaschana Mam to Vedana Kaschana Way to go, you're better than me. <laughs> the first line was, you know, kind of tricky, but <laughs> <laughs> slowly. Okay, anyone else? Okay, if not, let's just read the translation in purport. Actually, I, I said that we just recited once and I just went with the flow the way we do it <laughs> all the time. So I you wanted to hear Squacko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Translation. Oh, Arjuna, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know everything that has happened in the past, all that is happening in the present, and all things that are yet to come. I also know all living entities, but me, no one knows. Purport. Here, the question of personality and impersonality is clearly stated. If Krishna, the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, were Maya, material, as the impersonalists consider him to be, 
then like the living entity he would change his body and forget everything about his past life anyone with a material body cannot remember his past life nor can he for foretell his future life nor can he predict the outcome of his present life therefore he cannot know what is happening in past present and future unless one is liberated from material contamination he cannot know past present and future unlike the ordinary human being lord krishna clearly says that he completely knows what happened in the past what is happening in the present and what will happen in the future in the fourth chapter we have seen that lord krishna remembers instructing vivaswan the sun god millions of years ago krishna knows every living entity because he is situated in every living being's heart as the super soul but despite his presence in every living entity as super soul and his presence as the supreme personality of godhead the less intelligent even if able to realize the impersonal brahman cannot realize shri krishna as a supreme person certainly the transcendental body of shri krishna is not perishable he is just like the sun and maya is like a cloud in the material world we can see that there is the sun and that there are clouds and different stars and planets the clouds may cover all these in the sky per temporarily but this covering is only apparent to our limited vision the sun moon and stars are not actually covered similarly maya cannot cover the supreme lord by his eternal potency he is not manifest to less intelligent class of men as it is stated in the third verse of this chapter out of millions and millions of men some try to become perfect in this human form of life and out of thousands and thousands of such perfected men hardly one can understand what lord krishna is even if one is perfected by realization of impersonal brahman or localized parmatma he cannot possibly understand the supreme personality of godhead shri krishna without being in krishna consciousness so again i read the translation o arjuna is the supreme personality of godhead i know everything that has happened in the past all that is happening in the present and all the all things that are yet to come i also know all living entities but me no one knows so here krishna reveals his omniscience you know i know everything i know every living entity i know what has happened in the past i know what is going to happen in the future and i also know what is happening currently in every, any different you know any any place you know everywhere what is happening i am completely aware of everything prabhupad uses this in his purport as a uh, an argument to uh, to again um, Uh, against the mayavadi philosophy the mayavadi's philosophy is that you know krishna is actually his form is a product of maya we had discussed that yesterday i'm not going to repeat that but their idea is that you know krishna's form is a product of maya his form is temporary and then his form he will lose like all of us because our forms are also you know, temporary you know the material forms are temporary this body is temporary it's going to fall similarly krishna's body will also fall and krishna will merge back into brahman that is their idea but propad uses this verse to condemn this mayavadi philosophy that any anyone who has a fallible body he cannot uh, remember his past present and future you know so he, krishna has to be uh, beyond this uh, uh, material world you know he is not a part of this material world so propad also gives the uh, the uh, reference from the fourth chapter and he says uh, he points out to birds uh, the 4.1 imam vivaswate yogam proktavan ham avyam vivaswan manave praha manurikshu vakya bravit i gave this knowledge to the sun god that's all and, and arjuna he actually uh, immediately asks you know okay if you gave this knowledge how can i understand this you know because you are just maybe 100 years old you know on this and, and vivaswan is you know, millions and millions of years and he is existing from time immemorial from the i am the creation happened in the material world and he is you know senior to you by birth so how can you give knowledge to uh, to sun god to vivaswan and in response in 4.5 krishna says uh, you know bahuni me vyati tani janmani tava arjuna tanya aham veda sarvani na tvam vetha parantapani he says actually many 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 births both you and i have taken i can remember all of them but you cannot you know because arjuna's body is fallible arjuna is in the material body krishna in the body he is spiritual so veda so veda means knowledge to know you know so veda uh, there are multiple meanings to the word veda so we understand that sanskrit is a multivalent language v- words have different meanings you know even the word bhagwan may have different meanings so we have to understand in what context it is being like in the previous word uh, in the previous verse the word prakash was used so prakash in one sense means light 
but um, here krishna used the word prakash in a uh, in a sense that you know people cannot understand me you know that's how krishna uses the word prakash in the previous so so sanskrit is a multivariate language so vedaham samtitani you know uh, i know everything you know uh, everything krishna says uh, but me no one knows so this is in a way krishna has also talked about uh, this in the 10th chapter you know we can think that okay ordinary people don't know krishna but krishna tells in the 10th chapter that not even the uh, what is that verse uh, even the great sages the great rishis even the demigods even they cannot understand krishna they cannot know krishna so what to speak of ordinary people you know uh, he says uh, न मे विदु सुरगण प्रभव न मर्षय अहम आदि महर्षि सो द डेमिगॉड डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड कृष्णा यू नो सो दिस देर इज एन एक्साम्पल ऑफ दिस राइट इन द श्रीमद भागवतम सो वी हैव बोथ लॉर्ड ब्रह्मा एंड लॉर्ड इंद्रा लॉर्ड ब्रह्मा इज कंसिडर्ड टू बी द ओरिजिनल ब्राह्मण यू नो ही इज कंसिडर्ड टू बी द मोस्ट इंटेलिजेंट मोस्ट वाइज सो ही गेट्स बिविल्डर्ड बाय कृष्णा यू नो वी हैव द ब्रह्म वि मोहन लीला दैट इज गिवन इन द Uh, in the tenth chapter, uh, in the tenth canto of Shrimad Bhagavatam, fourteenth chapter, I believe, uh, Prabhupada quotes a verse from the Brahma Vimohan Lila in the previous verse. Prabhupada had quoted the purport from one of the, uh, one of the verses. And then we also have the uh, example of Indra getting bewildered, where the, we just celebrated the uh, you know Govardhan Puja. So the whole Govardhan Puja pastime is uh, is uh, related to that pastime where Krishna had lifted the Govardhan hill because Indra was attacking the Brajavasis because he did, didn't understand Krishna's position. So Indra is like Brahma is the head of the Brahmans. He's the original Brahman. Indra is supposed to be the most strongest. You know, he is like a Kshatriya. You know, he is the quintessential Kshatriya. There is no one, nobody, nobody is supposed to be more stronger than Indra. you know he it is uh, in the he has the most martial power with him but even he couldn't understand krishna so na me vidusur gana na prabhavam na maharshaya so neither the demigods neither the host of the uh, the maharishis the maharishis they are considered to be very wise people you know they are they could be ascetics they could be yogis you know but they are supposed to have knowledge you know but if brahma cannot understand how could these maharishis because maharishis generally they are considered to be lower in knowledge from brahma brahma has received knowledge directly from lord vishnu and then krishna says aham adir hi devana you know because i am the beginning of you know i am the origin of all these devatas not just the devatas even the maharishis maharishis i am the origin you know so they cannot understand me so the idea is that Uh, they don't understand krishna fully you know and sometimes even the demigods may not understand krishna's su- supreme position they will know vishnu because from a operational perspective vishnu uh, is their boss you know anything that you know any problems that happen in the material world they approach lord brahma and through lord brahma they approach lord vishnu that's how the hierarchy goes you know sometimes they may also go to lord shiva so and lord shiva can you know then he goes to brahma and through brahma they go to vishnu that's the hierarchy generally that is followed so even they they may know vishnu but they may not know krishna so krishna in that sense he is covered you know he doesn't uh, people cannot understand krishna and no mam tu vedana kasina me no one knows so that is the meaning of that but krishna knows everything you know because he is situated as parmatma in the heart not just parmatma we understand that as shirodaksha vishnu he enters each and every atom of this universe vishnu the word vishnu means one who is uh, present in every anu of the vishwa anu means atom and vishwa means world of the universe so he is present in every atom of the universe that is the name of the, the that is the meaning of the word vishnu there, there could be other meanings of word vishnu also but this is just one meaning of vishnu so yagya vai vishnu as prabhupad quotes one more meaning from the vedas you know vishnu means yagya purush uh, so that there could there are multiple meanings of the word vishnu but this is also one of the meanings and in that sense because he is present in every single atom of the universe as parmatma as shirodakshai vishnu he knows everything you know he knows what has happened in the in the past what is now the point that comes is okay he krishna says i know what's going to happen in the future so this uh, sometimes it bewilders people that okay if krishna knows what is going to happen in the future that means there is no free will you know krishna already knows everything 
you know, we are just programmed. You know, what is going to happen in the future? You can only know when the things are programmed. You know, if you have created a program, then uh, you know you know how this program is going to work and what is going to be the output of this program. So, is it that Krishna uh, has programmed this word, and that's where he that's he that's how he understands uh, what is going to happen in the future? So, this is a question for everyone. Anyone would like to to share their inputs what does it mean that krishna knows everything that's going to happen in the future and if that is the case is there a free will that exists oh you're saying if it's programmed to know exactly what's going to happen what's the point of free will you're saying right yeah because krishna i know what's going to happen in the future so doesn't it sound counterproductive that right? okay we say that sounds, oh, we yeah it does to... does sounds contradictory yeah. yeah um something just popped into my head so is it possible that he knows it in the sense that he knows every outcome meaning you have the free will to take whatever road you want and whichever road you take he already knows the outcome but you have the free will so if you choose to Let's say you're encountered by a guy who's trying to, you know, get into an argument with him. You're way bigger than him. You can knock him down. You choose to knock him down, there are consequences. You choose to ignore him and walk away. There is, you know, consequences to that as well. Krishna knows the two outcomes before you make them. Whichever one you make, that's where your free will lies. I'm just, you know, trying to create an example. In every situation, you have one way to go or the other or the other. Whichever one you choose, he already knows what the outcome will be because he transcends time. But he's given you free will to see your choices and make one of them. Either way, he's beyond any of the choices you make. So it's not like he knows per se what choice you're going to make. He's giving you the free will to make any of these choices. He's not interfering in which one you make. So he's not caring about knowing which one you make. You make the choice. He knows the outcome. He can know whatever choice you want to make if he wants to, but I don't think he cares for that because he's giving you the free will. However, he knows the outcome. The outcome really matters more than the choice, I believe. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Yeah, so I mean, if I would rephrase, so what you're saying is there are different ways and uh, different ways will lead you to different destinations. You have because the free we're, talking, we're talking about free will here in the context of uh, having free will. Go ahead, sorry. Right. So you are saying that you have the free will to choose what, which way you want to take. But once you have taken the way, then the destination is kind of given. You know, there is no U-turn. That okay, if you have taken a particular way, then that's you. Yeah, know, if you take system. your actions, the consequences will come right. with it. Krishna is yeah. aware of the consequences. We're Correct. saying he's all knowing. So if he's all knowing, where is our free will? It looks like we're predestined. No, he's right. given us choices. Whichever, even if the choices are a million choices you have that you can go, roads you can take, he knows every outcome of any of those roads when you take them because your life is planned according to the choices that you take eventually. Yep. I think uh, what you were saying it makes sense. Uh, we also see that happening in the Mahabharata itself, where Krishna goes as a Shanti Dut. Although Krishna knew that Duryodhana is not going to accept the proposal, but he had given a choice to Duryodhana that you accept this. Uh, this proposal of uh, of peace, this peace proposal, and then there will be no war. You know, just uh, in fact, he watered it down so much. You know, he first he said you must give, you must return the whole kingdom that you had taken by deceit from the Pandavas. Later he said just give five villages. That's it. You don't have to give anything else. Five villages. That's all. You know, keep the whole kingdom. Give the give five villages. But Duryodhana even rejected that. So Krishna is omniscient, you know, Krishna is saying Vedaham Samtitani Vatmanani Charjuna. You know, so he if he is omniscient, didn't he know that Duryodhana is not going to accept this peace proposal? He knew actually. He knew. But where's the free will if you didn't give him a choice, right? Right. 
exactly. exactly. So when Duryodhana had made the choice, okay, I don't want to accept this free will. Then Krishna says later in the Bhagavad Gita itself, Krishna reveals in the eleventh chapter that everyone is going to die on this battlefield. You know, nobody is going to you know all except you, all except the Pandavas is going to perish in this battle. So because the choice was made by Duryodhana, so and Krishna had given the option to not mm-hmm. to fight the war, but then after the fruits are in the hands of once you you know you can do your karma, the fruits are given by Krishna. Mm-hmm. So that also, is. But they also say for those who surrender to Krishna, right. he gives he gives greater direction. Exactly. Yeah. And so, whatever happens in their lives, even if it's good or bad, Krishna is in one sense directing them back to Godhead. You know. Right. Those so, who have yeah. So what happens is Krishna is always present in the heart as Paramatma. He is always guiding the soul. You know, he wants the soul to turn towards Krishna. You know, mm-hmm. so Krishna is uh, is aware about all the different you know the desires, our inclinations. You know, so basically all of us are in different modes. You know, we have the different composition of sattva, rajas, and tamas within ourselves. You know, and based so how the modes work is you know we perceive things and we act on the our own perceptions based on our uh, you know the composition of different modes that we have. So Krishna will talk about it later in the fourteenth chapter, in thirteenth and fourteenth chapter. He introduced the modes. So in that context, because he understand what is the composition of different modes within our within us, he understand what is going to be our regular general activities. and also based on our previous uh, uh, karma that we had done in previous lives we have a particular destiny you know so that destiny is more or less given the main things in our in our life are fixed you know how much pleasure we will get how much misery we will get you know how much we will live those things are fixed you know in that sense because you know we had done some karma in the past life and that karma is coming as our destiny in this life So destiny is referred to as daivadishthanam tatha karta karanam cha pratak vidham vividhas cha pratak cheshta daivam cha vatra panchamam. These are five. Although factors. it says it, Krishna reduces it to a great degree for a surrendered soul. Yeah. So uh, it is like, say, for example, we have to um, go to a particular place and we board the flight to go to that place. Now you know, once we are inside the flight, you know. we can't you know abruptly make the plane land you know but once we are in the flight you know we have the free will to eat what what we want to eat to sleep whenever you want to sleep to watch a movie whenever we want to watch the movie so that free will is there with us but we cannot change the course of the flight we cannot change uh, you know by our um, intervention so it is like that so the main things in our life you know because we are you know this life is like a journey so the main things in our life are fixed but within that we have certain free will there are certain situations that will come in our life based on the previous karma that we have done and how we react to that you know how what choices we make at those time that will fix our future destiny you know so we are making our destiny every time we make an action that makes our destiny if we choose the right action you know we will get a good destiny right i mean the pandavas did not live a suffering uh, life devoid of suffering but they were still surrendered so exactly they yeah, every know. moment they were surrendered despite yes. of the fact that despite they were continuously the, suffering yes, exactly, exactly so many sufferings were coming in their life but they mm-hmm. never lost the trust on krishna and... right they saw it as krishna's they 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 took krishna's direction at at every turn you know yeah and this question is actually a question that different acharyas have given different explanation of course all these uh, explanations are complementary it's not contradictory different acharyas so some acharyas say that okay it is because uh, krishna is outside the time domain you know he is outside the material so it for him it is like a dimension you know he can see exactly what's in the, uh, for us we cannot know what's going to happen in the future but because krishna it's, it's like a dimension for him so he can see some acharyas say that okay when we are driving on a road you know and we can see f- far away you know when we are from our window if it's a day time and if it's a straight road we can see what's happening 300 meters 400 meters although we have not reached that point yet but we can see it from our distance so krishna's knowledge is like that you know he can see but we cannot see you know but we when uh, you know it's like when we come to that point then we know exactly what's happening but krishna is not like krishna can see for for far distance that's how some acharyas explain so th- there are different explanations that are given for this 
but the point is that the 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 whole idea of bhagavad gita krishna is giving you know he is urging the soul to make the right decision that kinds of tells that you know every soul has a free will you know he, at the end of the bhagavad gita krishna will tell to arjuna that arjuna you decide what you want to do you know i have given you this knowledge now you contemplate on this fully and you decide what you want to do so when krishna is giving that choice to arjuna that means arjuna has the free will to to either accept krishna's uh, direction or reject krishna so duryodhana had rejected krishna's direction but we understand from the context that actually arjuna accepted krishna's direction mm-hmm. and both had different destinies duryodhana was uh, you know he was destroyed but arjuna he uh, not only he you know retained his kingdom in this life but his next life also was you know uh, we understand uh, from mahabharat what happened to arjuna in his next life so in that sense uh, the free will is always there so i know we have exceeded the time and there any last comments or anything that anyone like to mention i think kwako had a question why was the bhagavad gita spoken on the battlefield has anybody ever speculated on that why cuz he could have chosen a million settings but there must have been spe- something special about a battlefield that he thought will be profound to uh, yeah again uh, so yeah a lot of people ask this question and there are different answers given by different people to this question my understanding about this is uh, the the war of the mahabharat is at the heart of the scripture mahabharat you know the you know every all the different um, everything that is happening in the mahabharat it is leading towards this war this is like the central thing you know central theme in the mahabharat you know this mm-hmm. war so this war was fought for 18 days and when this war was happening actually everyone was you know all the different personalities of the universe you know all the devatas even we know from the context that vedvyas was also with his he was uh, with his divine vision he was looking at what's happening on the battlefield many different sages were watching what's happening on the battlefield even sanjay was uh, watching and he was narrating it to dhritarashtra Mm-hmm. so krishna chooses this setting uh, at this so particular sanjay point because live sanjay was live streaming the information yeah exactly yeah, yeah. different channels <laughs> were there so he purposely yeah. chooses this uh, his uh, this particular setting and arjuna gets bewildered at this time and then you know this in in a sense uh, this setting of a uh, battlefield conveys the urgency of this message and the whole battle was you know battle doesn't wait for anyone <laughs> we, mm-hmm. but this message was so urgent it was so important that mm-hmm. the battle had to wait you know we understand even uh, because bhishma was the commander of the other side he signals his army to wait because he understand there is a discussion that is happening between krishna and arjuna no and this uh, there is uh, in different puranas it is mentioned for how many prahars this discussion lasted so uh, there are different estimates given based on the prahar that are mentioned so at least it lasted at least for 90 minutes you know at the minimum but there are certain other calculations also some people say it lasted for much more than that but we can accept okay for 90 minutes they hold it um, the battle um and you know this discussion uh, continues for 90 minutes and different personalities from the universe was watching and we understand mm-hmm. that vedvyas actually pens it down so he chooses purposely this particular setting to give this important message in the movie actually right when the conversation is about to start um or is going on uh duryodhana tells is angry why is this going on we're supposed to fight you know and then the standard they're talking and then Bish, bishma says I, i oh my god i wish i was born arjuna today like he says something to that to that extent that he wishes he was born in arjuna's body in this moment he, he's cursing his stars for not being born as arjuna i thought that was profound because everybody he was like he knew whatever was going on that moment was you know something that very know, important change, change, change. transcendental yeah yeah Abu, uh, i had a common question uh, krishna is also called adoksha ja right that means is uh, beyond uh, uh, knowledge that's acquired through your senses so in the, in this verse like krishna says no one understands me but so knowledge that uh, through your spiritual you know vision or something then can you understand krishna 
like i think uh, somewhere i read like when krishna gives you mercy then you can understand him so that's like so if you if it's beyond the knowledge acquired through your senses then that's that's spiritual and so if you have spiritual vision probably can you understand krishna um <clears throat> so uh adokshada to my understanding is that something that is beyond the senses you are right uh, you know we you know we from our regular senses we cannot understand krishna so basically my understanding mata ji is that there are two ways to know krishna as krishna himself reveals one is re, re, you know there has to be a revelation and krishna is doing this revelation here in the bhagavad gita he is introducing himself he is presenting himself as a supreme person and uh, you know he is revealing himself his own position and but we have to accept it and believe it and then you know uh, uh, so but this revelation also how it comes to us there has to be a uh, a via medium that via medium is actually the guru and krishna also recommends that you go to a guru and then you surrender to him and worship him and uh, serve him and then the guru will give you the the knowledge and even from the setting of the bhagavad gita we can understand that when you know krishna doesn't start speaking the gita unless arjuna surrenders when arjuna surrenders and he says that now i am your disciple and you are my guru you know i request you to please instruct me so after uh, you know accepting uh, krishna as the guru then krishna starts instructing arjuna until then he doesn't so of course there has to be a via medium uh, for us to understand krishna you know somebody who has seen krishna who who knows krishna he can actually give krishna to us he can reveal krishna to us so um, but krishna also says that you know you know i can be known by devotional service you know that is the only way i can be known there is no other way krishna says that in the 11th chapter so i don't know if you were referring to something else besides this these two uh i mean i'm sure there could be other answers to this but uh bhaktya tu ananya shakya ham evam vidho arjuna gyatum drishtum cha tatvena praveshtum cha paranta pad that's how krishna puts it in the 54th verse of uh, the 11th chapter and before that in fact he says na ham veder na tapasana gyane na dane na cha ijya shakya evam vidho drishtum drishtava na simam yata you know, i cannot be known by vedas i cannot be known by different austerities neither by giving charity nor by different kinds of fire sacrifices you know, he says i cannot be known i cannot be known by these means and later he says bhakti atu ananya shakya but this knowledge also that you know we are supposed to do bhakti you no know, that has to come from the guru because unless the guru reveals this to us we will it's very difficult you know i only came to know about this when i had a guru you know? <laughs> so thank you yes. for reminding us nice explanation prof yeah very nice in fact when i was uh, uh, young of malti priya there used to be a song that if krish if uh, hari is upset guru can pacify him but if the guru ups- guru is upset hari will never accept you <laughs> so the via media is very important like um, ganpati govind said and pleasing the guru and going through him is our only hope i also read i also read somewhere like krishna himself doesn't know all of his qualities is that true like i don't know well uh, in the bhagavad i mean it could be but in the bhagavad gita uh, the way arjuna puts it in the 10th chapter is that you know you know he says that actually i accept everything that you have said i accept that nobody can understand you nor the devtas nor the the rakshasas and the asuras but he says actually krishna you know yourself and therefore you reveal yourself to to me you tell me about yourself that's how he puts it so from the context of the gita we can understand krishna knows everything and he knows himself but uh, maybe it is that you know at times krishna also you know <laughs> his glories are unlimited but i would accept expect krishna to know at least his own glories <laughs> that's how arjuna ex- 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 accepts but uh, when he saw his own reflection of how beautiful he was he was surprised oh, yeah. you know this is first time so that yeah that's true mother there is this verse that swayam uh, eva atman atmanam vetha tvam purushottama bhuta bhavan bhutesha deva deva jagat that you know swayam eva atman atmanam that you know yourself you know 
and then he is asked keshu keshu cha bhaveshu chintyo si bhagavat mai you tell me how do i how am i supposed supposed to see your uh, you know, see you in this uh, cosmic manifestation yeah but what you the the example that you gave was also right All right. I think you can end here. Yes, Prabhu, go ahead. Uh, so uh, the example that you mentioned that Krishna, when he uh, went to Duryodhan as a agent of peace, then he knew that Duryodhan is not going to accept. So, uh, so that is a reaction by Duryodhan, right? And then. krishna knew already it's the reaction gonna come so even though it appears to be a freedom it's a false freedom right um to be honest sorry something just i doubt because i thought about this earlier on i didn't think it was false because he one you have given been given at least one choice right in that spectrum of choice don't forget even do your na has the opportunity to say hey i'm not go- that i'm not just going to give them five villages or whatever these are my cousins i'm going to give them more he has a wide array of you know i'm saying choices that he can make that can lead to so many different outcomes his heart is that of a person that is set to do evil so once you have an impure mind and you're living in a life of you know evil which you chose to do you are going to have be, and krishna knows this guy is an evil guy i give him his choices if he doesn't take it i am I, if he takes the choices i'll be surprised but i know he won't take it because that is his nature not i have created him that way but that is the nature he has picked up while others in this world have not picked up that nature so i think krishna is going based on the nature of the man he has known who has acquired the nature the man has acquired on this life knowing duryodhana i'll be surprised if he takes these other choices he will most 99.99999% give say he's not going to even give them and he said i won't even give them a pin a, a land to be able to stick a pin in but he has a choice to even say hey you know what krishna thanks for coming ahead and get, uh, telling me to give my brothers five i'll give them 10 or 50 you know he has choices but he's an evil man so he will it's not based on he doesn't have free will it's based on the nature he has acquired on this earth as a person because if you had put maybe arjuna in the same circumstance Arjuna is also a man of the same age who may have said okay you know what thank you for I'll give them more just depending on who is standing there so in the same way if Duryodhana had acquired some other modes or natures in this life he could have decided that based on Krishna's offer he's going to take it and Krishna coming in that way you know hey this man has a little bit of goodness in him there's a possibility but knowing duryodhana's evil nature i don't know i'm sorry go ahead ganapati prabhuji uh no i think uh, what you said is kind of making sense also but i think what he is trying to also ask is although he has the free will Uh, you know but that is like a false free will what is the use of such a free will that you are, cannot make the right choices is am i understand your question correctly bro that's what you mean uh <clears throat> uh no prabhu ji i think my question was that krishna see the future as per this verse right so and you use the way you explain that he knew duryodhan is not going to accept and exactly the same reaction from duryodhana we saw so duryodhana we didn't see any other reaction even though he had a free will and uh, krishna also knew it's coming so which looks like a programmed 
activity right where krishna no i am going to hastinapur after two days i am going to make a proposal and duryodhan is going to reject so i was my mind was thinking this more like a programmed that in that context i asked this question prabhu so why bother to ask is that what you are saying madhav kanta prabhu if you know he's going to reject why bother to ask i think oh, what he's saying is krishna has already seen the future the guy didn't have a choice he just gave him a choice because it's like okay krishna can go between time right he could have visited the future seen what the man's actions would be before the man took the actions and then came and gave the man a choice and then while he knows that this man in the future when i visited the future he already made the other choice already i don't know if it makes sense it's like no, let's what were you thinking mother from the prabhu is that what you were thinking uh yeah there are two things one is uh when uh, this whole conversation started of whether it's a program everything is programmed versus a level of free will then i was uh, when uh, thinking about this particular situation it appears to me it's all programmed and then the second uh, thing that came to my mind is whether whether there is really a free will at all if it is programmed so these are the two things kind of going on in my mind but i was thinking like a compassionate mother even though she knows her son might be evil still tries to see if she can reform him couldn't it be that krishna has that compassion to our towards everyone equally i um uh... in in the uh, what you are saying is uh, that makes sense amata ji um, that uh, you know krishna always have that hope that you know at some point exactly. we turn towards hope. krishna a compassionate lose... mother yeah hopes against hope that the evil son might turn around you know right that i think that's why he hope. gives us choice in the first place too as well right yeah but in the context of what happened in the mahabharat i think krishna himself says that at one point before he goes to the shanti dut that you know he says that i am doing this for you because you know in the future nobody should say that we asked for this war you know everybody mm-hmm. should see that right. we are giving we are putting all the options and war is the last option that we are using because when everything right. is is not working out then we are choosing war as the last option he says that actually to the yeah. yeah and that's why he agrees to go himself and krishna if you really see krishna is the most important person and he going as the shanti dut now you send your best man as the shanti dut as a, so they that kind of shows the urgency that you know they really wanted peace you know otherwise you could have just sent some ordinary person that okay we had this proposal can you please accept it but krishna actually goes himself and then he is the most important person there in that uh, on that side and he presents the peace proposal so the best man was sent that also shows the uh, the how earnestly pandavas wanted peace you know and then the the choice that okay we are ready to accept only five villages but we want peace even that when it was rejected and actually in one sense krishna uh, duryodhana did exceed krishna's expectations because something that i don't think in the mahabharat anywhere it is mentioned that duryodhana tries to arrest krishna in the assembly that was outrageous that was completely outrageous and i don't think anywhere it is mentioned that krishna expected or anticipated that krishna that duryodhana might do something like this so to arrest to try to arrest a peace messenger and even to serve, to uh, to try to arrest a person of the caliber of krishna that was you know that was completely disrespect not just disrespect disrespectful to the pandavas to krishna but it was outrageous so like trying to disrupt draupadi also was outrageous in one sense you know because she was the empress of the of the whole world at that time you know Uh, and in the assembly where you know the dharma is supposed to be upheld in that assembly they tried to disrupt draupadi that was also outrageous but more outrageous was to try to arrest krishna so i would say in that sense uh, duryodhana expected or exceeded krishna's expectations <laughs> he was so demoniac that you know not you know he, he did not stop at just rejecting the proposal he also tries to arrest krishna he thinks that you know if i am able to arrest krishna then pandavas will you know, they will not fight so 
but you, if you notice like he somewhere in there krishna you know i think you mentioned it earlier on today that krishna tells arjuna that all these people are gonna you know i've destroyed all these people already they, they're done the only people may that may are... yeah, may vaite, Va, that's how he puts it in the 11th chapter right the only survivors are going to be you and your brothers you know right. um but then he states well, obviously, we are, he states that even these people that are getting destroyed, they're getting destroyed because of their association with these people to come and fight. He doesn't just say they're all getting destroyed for any reason, but he says it's because of their siding with the side of evil. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> yeah, oh, but even uh, everybody on the side of Pandavas also die. Even Abhimanyu dies in the battlefield. And Krishna tells that, that except for you, everybody will die on this battlefield. So why so, why will the why does the soldiers of these people why do they all get vanquished of the Pandavas? What's the rationale behind that? Well, the I, yeah, the understanding that is given so. is Kaliuga was about to start at that time, and uh, you know um, the Kshatriyas they are imp impetuous. You know, even we see that uh, Krishna's own side, the Yadavas, you know, uh, they are also impetuous. They fought with each other and they killed themselves. So he didn't want to leave any powerful kshatriyas on the planet because um, you know the, the idea is that you know if the kshatriyas they are not controlled they can misuse their power and we see it many times even in the ramayana in mahabharata also we see ashwatthama try to you know uh, unauthorizedly he uses that brahma brahmastra you know he didn't know how to use it he just know how to but when to use it why to use it those things he was not aware of but he still uses brahmastra so those are the examples where, you know, we can see that, you know, the powerful people, if they're not checked, you know, if they don't, if they're not under the proper guidance, they may misuse their powers. So one of the, uh, this was one of the missions of Krishna, you know, he wanted to uh, rid the world with all of these powerful men. And he actually assembled everyone on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and then he lets them kill each other. On the battle. Oh, okay. So, well, that makes sense why he decided to at least give that information in that battle. Is you know, the, everybody's about to die. Humanity was going to get renewed again. Yeah, and in fact, he also even the Yadavas they kill him, kill themselves, and you know they were also very powerful. Yadavas were extremely powerful at that time. You know, these Satyaki and other warriors on the side of Yadavas they were extremely powerful. So they also are you know, at, uh, at towards the end of Krishna's pastime, even they are annihilated and nobody is, just the Pandavas remain. And they also kind of, when the news reaches to them that Krishna has departed, they also kind of, you know, voluntarily they give up, they renounce and they start walking towards the Himalayas, towards the north. That is the understanding given by the Acharyas. Mm, so That's the probably exactly. question about the free will, I don't think we've still... You know, we've got an answer to that. Is it free will or is it fake free will? Free will is always there because if free will is not there, then Krishna doesn't have to have to speak the Bhagavad Gita. He could have just laughed at Arjuna's question that I know you are going to fight <laughs> because you don't have any free will and just don't waste my time. <laughs> just sit on the battlefield and sit on the chariot and do what I'm saying to you. The whole idea of talking about the whole Bhagavad Gita where Krishna is telling the choices and the consequences. You know, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Therefore, you should do this. That's how Krishna puts this. So the whole idea that he is speaking the Bhagavad Gita, he is talking about the, you know, so many different things is because he wants Arjuna to make the right decision. He wants Arjuna to make the right choice. Otherwise, what is the need to speak the Bhagavad Gita if you don't have any free will? Mm -hmm. The For whole message is redundant, you know. It doesn't make any sense. If we don't have free will, why should we read Bhagavad Gita? You know, we are, because we don't have any free will, we will do whatever we are programmed to do. So, mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It cannot work like that, even in the material world. Forget about Bhagavad Gita. If we accept that we don't have any free will, I go and kill a person and I say, oh, I have been programmed to kill that person. Then I cannot be held, held accountable for my acts, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm just programmed to do it. I can go and do anything that I want and say that I have been programmed to do like this. So that's why you know, this is not, not my, my fault. So we have to take accountability. We have to be responsible for our actions. So that responsibility, that accountability can only come when we understand, when we accept, at least at the operational level, at a existential level that we have free will. Mm -hmm. 
but when you surrender your free will to krishna krishna will kind of take charge of your life you know he will help you guide you. that's true mother ji like he how takes charge. he took care of pro father ship you know krishna and surrender relieves you of the suffering you know the suffering from all the effects of karma and all that once you this that's why you know mataji said earlier on that krishna relieves has a way those who surrender has a way of you know relieving you it's like if you surrender just the process of surrender the things you learn the process you go through let you look at life from the point of view where you don't suffer from experience in life well suffering may still be there we see that even the devotees who have sun it sometimes they get terrible diseases i know the suffering is always there in a sense that the body gets a terrible disease right. you don't get a terrible disease right, right. yeah we so the yeah. body may have some discomfort but we don't suffer because we understand we are not the body we are so yeah that's right that is the correct that's understanding that's something you learn from surrendering to krishna through so, learning the bhagavad gita that you're right. not the body and you are something else and that's how you know if you get a disease and you have really firmly stuck in that consciousness yeah if we have a we have a lot of suffering it's totally different from the guy who thinks that he's completely the body and wants to eat all the food in the world and do all the things that you know the body wants then he is the he feels the suffering like you know he's living in hell right now you know it is some kind of illusion it's temporary and you know you, you look at that from, look at it from those lens that's been my experience you know of, since i started in this path yeah yeah i used to suffer a lot but <clears throat> i realized i don't suffer like that anymore at all with the same experiences but i don't suffer from them you know they are different it's just like they exist okay they come and they go and you know right so what essentially what happens is the surrender you know at least when we surrender you know krishna can give us at least partial uh, freedom from illusion you know to the extent we are free from illusion we can see things in their proper context we can see things from a spiritual vision you know, that spiritual vision cannot come until we are in, uh, in illusion so you know if you know we when we see we when we come to the spiritual platform and look at things then the as you said the suffering that at that point becomes optional you know it's not mandatory you know if we choose to remain grounded in a material consciousness then yes the suffering is there but if we choose to be in a spiritual consciousness then the suffering uh, is kind of because the body will still have the discomfort whatever is there but you know at least we are suffering. not our consciousness is yeah, anxiety not, uh, anger you know all kinds of disorders that pop out of <laughs> suffering right. you know that's really what leads to a lot of things that even project itself and manifest into physical actions and stuff like that yep i think we had a very good discussion today we are 30 minutes over time so i know there's another session that is to start here now on this so i think we have to end it really now Thank you everyone thank you for joining once a kalpataru bhasya kripa sindhu bhai